Uh, I'm Bruce Cunningham, the Dean of the School of Public Policy here, and on behalf of the school, I'd like to welcome all of you to the 2010-2011 uh, uh, Terry Sanford Distinguished Lecture. Uh, the Sanford Lecture was endorsed by a gift from the William R. Keenan Charitable Trust. Its purpose is to invite a distinguished person in public life to deliver a formal lecture to the Duke community and also to spend some time with Duke students, which our distinguished lecturer has done during a series of meetings throughout the day. Meeting first with uh, the group that works on gridlock, then with the American Grand Strategy Group, uh, where's Peter, somewhere here, and, and then with the uh, DeWitt Wallace Center Group. This lecture honors both the founder of the Sanford School and his extraordinary public service to the university, the state, and the nation. Past Sanford lectures have included, among others, Shimon Perez, Oscar Arias, Robert McNamara, Yasuhiro Nakasone, Turgut Azal, and Tom Friedman. This year's Sanford Distinguished Lecturer is David Brooks. Born in Toronto, he grew up in New York City in the suburbs of Philadelphia. He graduated from the University of Chicago with a degree in history and began his journalism career as a police reporter for the City News Bureau, a wire service owned jointly by the Chicago Tribune and Sun-Times. He subsequently spent nine years as the Wall Street Journal, at the Wall Street Journal, where he was successively a correspondent based in Brussels covering Russia, the Middle East, South Africa, and European affairs, an editor of the book review section, and the journal's movie critic before becoming editor of its opinion pages. For the last seven years, he's been an op-ed columnist for the New York Times. His writing has appeared in the New Yorker, the Washington Post, Forbes, the Public Interest, the Times Literary Supplement, the New Republic, and Commentary, among others. He's also a regular commentator on the evening PBS television news program, The News Hour, and a frequent commentator on national public radio and CNN. He's the author of two books, Bobos in Paradise, The New Upper Class and How They Got There, and On Paradise Drive, How We Live Now and Always Have in the Future Tense. At some point along the way, he stopped being only a journalist and became a pundit. His ideas and opinions are sought, not because, are sought out because he is a keen observer of both human nature and human enterprise. He helps us analyze and understand present day events by putting them in historical and cultural context. It doesn't hurt that he's witty and makes us laugh at ourselves. David Brooks once described himself as a former liberal who, who came to his senses. <laughs> On the New York Times editorial page, he's pegs, pegged as the conservative voice, but Brooks makes it hard for anyone to categorize him. And he is one of a handful of people in this country who can seriously be characterized as a public intellectual. He has written in support of causes typically associated with a liberal agenda, including gay marriage, gun control, and abortion rights. He was a John McCain supporter, but he wrote of his admiration for Barack Obama's intelligence and urged him to run for president. Brooks' interests are broad, ranging from politics and foreign policy to neuroscience and child development. He's here tonight as the keynote speaker in a new series called Gridlock, can our system address America's big problems? Professors David Shanzer, who formerly worked on Capitol Hill, and Don Taylor, who has closely followed and analyzed the progress of health insurance reform on his blog, Free For All, launched this initiative because they hope the next generation that goes to Washington, and it may take another generation, can straighten out the mess that we're in. The causes of our current impasse are both personal and systemic, Fewer people seem willing to sacrifice for the public good, while distrust of governmental institutions has grown. Americans also tend to be unable or unwilling to understand and accept scientific findings, making it difficult to base policy decisions on facts and evidence. Meanwhile, campaign finance regulations give a huge amount of influence to relatively few people. Our political system rewards ideolog ideological purity over the hard work of compromise and consensus building, and the 24-hour news cycle heightens the role of strident voices on both sides of the political spectrum. While we argue major problems either go unsolved or continue to get worse, 
global warming, the deficit, unemployment, spiraling health care costs, the various conflicts in Southwest Asia, and massive trade deficits, to name a few. Through lectures such as this one, through courses we teach, conferences we hold, and research projects over the next two years, Gridlock will examine the causes and consequences of our nation's political paralysis. You can join the dialogue on the Gridlock blog, and you can find the link to it at the homepage of the Sanford School website. Meanwhile, we look forward to this keynote address that will help us contextualize our current dilemmas and understand the lay of the land. In 2006, David Brooks was a visiting lecturer at Duke and taught a course here at, the San at Sanford that our students loved. We're delighted to have him back to talk about politics and culture in the age of Obama. Please give a warm welcome to our Sanford Distinguished Lecturer for 2010-11, David Brooks. Thank you, Bruce, for that pick-me-up. Uh, it's a pleasure to be back in this building. I did teach a class here four years ago. Uh, I vowed to come back until I could figure my way out to how to get up to the actual classrooms. Um, still haven't mastered the stairways in this building. Uh, but I did have a great time uh, teaching here. I only teach at schools I couldn't have gotten into. Uh, and so I've taught at uh, Duke and Yale. Uh, and I hope to move on to other schools I couldn't have gotten into, the ones that rejected me. I did go to the University of Chicago, uh, the school where fun goes to die. Uh, yeah, the other saying about Chicago is, if I can get this right, it's a Baptist school where atheist professors teach Jewish students St. Thomas Aquinas. Uh, so, um, but, so this was a different experience. Uh, got to go to a few basketball games. Uh, thanks to some people here, I got to go to the UNC game this past year. Uh, that was me jumping over the bonfire afterwards. It was actually, I think, thanks to some people here, it was one of the tamest bonfires I've ever seen. I gather you've made up for it in the tailgating department, though, so <laughs> congratulations for that. Um, uh, and so I'm going to talk about uh, gridlock and uh, politics. Uh, I, uh, I thought I was going to be an academic, but went into journalism uh, and sort of defa I spent a lot of my time translating what academics do into, into uh, newspaper prose. Uh, but I'm glad I went into journalism because of the power of the relationships and personalities of the people involved and how, what power that has and how we're governed and the central destiny of the country. I have a friend who I mentioned earlier today who uh, worked at Johns Hopkins and then went to the State Department. And I asked him the question I ask many people, which is, what have you learned going into government that you didn't know before? And one of the questions I often get, by the way, is that uh, the quality of our military people is much higher than I thought it was, and the quality of our intelligence is actually lower than I thought it was. I get that answer a lot. But this, this fellow said to me, you know, I used to think uh, government was about 75% about personality and relationships, and now I realize it's 98% about personality and relationships. And I do think one of the virtues of being a journalist uh, is to actually interview the people. And you learn the importance of their psychology and the relationships between the people. And I'm going to talk a bit about that. Just one story to illustrate this phenomenon. It was told to me by a guy named Bob Kraft, and I've since confirmed it. And Bob Kraft, for those of you who follow football, is the owner of the New England Patriots. Uh, and he owns a container business, a big successful businessman. And he was part of the delegation going to Russia a few years ago. Uh, and as part of the delegation of business people, he met with Vladimir Putin. And Kraft, because the New England Patriots won, uh, have won the Super Bowl two or three times, was wearing his first Super Bowl ring on his finger at the meeting with then President Putin. And Putin sees the ring and he says to Kraft, you know, that's a beautiful ring, can I see it for a second? So Kraft takes it off his finger and hands it to P Putin. And Putin puts it on his finger and they're having the meeting. Uh, and they go on and Putin is gesturing with the ring on his finger. And then in the middle of the uh, meeting, Putin takes off the ring and slips it into his jacket pocket. And so after the meeting, Kraft comes up to him and says, um, uh, Mr. President, uh, you know, I'd be honored if I could make you a duplicate ring to that to give to you, but that particular ring has tremendous sentimental value to me. Uh, would you mind if I had it back? 
And Putin pretended he didn't hear the statement. And so Putin said, I, well, I mean, Kraft then went back to the embassy people after the meeting, and he said, I didn't really want to make a fuss. I don't want some big international inf incident. But could you just send out some feelers and get my ring back? I'll make them another one. And so they sent out the feelers, and they came back to Kraft the next day. And they said, you know, what we think you should do is issue a press release saying you've decided to donate that ring to the Russian people. Uh, and so that's what happened. Uh, and so the m first moral of the story is that the world is run by fourth graders. Um, uh, and, but the second moral of the story is never underestimate the importance of the weird things that go on in people's minds, uh, even if they're in positions of high authority. Now, when I took my current job, I was given a good piece of advice by Robert Novak, uh, which is to interview three politicians every day. And I don't always achieve that, but I try. And so I spend a lot of time around politicians and, and leaders and policymakers. And I can tell you from this experience, they're all emotional freaks of one sort or another. Uh, they have what I call logaria dementia, which is they talk so much they drive themselves insane. Um, they're sort of guaranteed to invade your personal space. So if you walk up to a senator, he'll stand way too close to you, put his hand on the back of your head, rub your face. I had dinner with a Republican senator who had his hand on my thigh the whole meal, squeezing. I once, well, this was years ago, I was in the Senate press gallery, and Ted Kennedy and Dan Quayle met in the Senate, and they were friends, and they gave each other big bear hugs, and their faces were like this far apart, and they were laughing and joking and talking, and they stayed hugging, and their hands were rubbing up and down each other's backs, and they were sort of moving there, and I was like, get a room, I don't want to see this. Um, but what they tend to have, some are smart, some are less smart, but what they tend to have is tremendous social antennae. They can go into a room or a turnpike rest stop and they can intuit, or at least think they can intuit, what people are feeling. And if they don't have this level of social skill, they, they manufacture it. I remember once this last election, I was, camp I was following Mitt Romney around as he was campaigning in New Hampshire, and he was up at a diner and he was campaigning with his five perfect sons, Bip, Chip, Rip, Sip, Dip, and Lip. And, <laughs> He, he would go to the tables at the diner and he would say, he would introduce himself to the people at the table, the family, and he would ask them what village in New Hampshire uh, they were from and he would describe the home he owned in their village. And then he went around uh, the table and he introduces himself to like 40 people. And on the way out, he first names almost everybody he's just met. And so that's a level of social skill that I don't have and I think many people don't have. Uh, but that's what they have. They have this social skill. Uh, and so I make fun of politicians a lot, and most of the time they deserve it. But the, the brute fact is most of them are in it for the right reason. The life they lead is actually not that glamorous. Uh, you know, if you fly on the shuttle or if you fly out of Washington on Thursday nights when Congress is letting out, you fly the last plane, you get on the plane at 10 or 11, there'll be eight members of a delegation going to California, going to New York. You get in at two in the morning, they've probably got another three or four hour drive to get home. It's just an exhausting, miserable life, and they do this every week. And so it's tough, it's a tough life, and you wouldn't do it unless you thought you were doing good. But they are trapped in a system which tests their character, to put it mildly. So I was interviewing a woman named Deborah Price, who was a moderate congresswoman from Columbus, Ohio, several years ago. And she was, she's in these tight race, the Columbus district is a very tight competitive district. And when you're in those districts, the consultants come in and take over your campaign. And she was running these really tough ads against her opponent, and her opponent was running really tough and vicious ads against her. One day she gets a call from her 93-year-old mother, and her mother says to her, uh, I want you to know I'm ashamed of you for the ads you're running against your opponent. And she held up one of some leaflets that went out under her name when she was telling me this story as if it was a soiled diaper. And it wasn't the stuff being thrown at her that bugged her, it was the stuff she was spewing out. And, and, but she said, you know, you don't win, you don't serve. And so if you wanna serve in public office, you gotta do what it takes to get elected. And this is the, the trade-offs they all face. And eventually she decided it wasn't worth it and she retired from the house. But this is the sort of character challenges they face every day. And it has gotten much, much worse as the years go on. And when you talk to people individually in the House, outside we think they're all, they're all these rotten partisans, they all they do is shout at each other. 
Inside, a lot of them semi-hate the lives they're leading and are unhappy with the lives, but are caught up in a pattern of interaction. And that's one of the things I'm gonna to try to talk about. The people themselves are fine and admirable. It's the pattern of behavior which leads to a sort of tribalism. And that sense of tribalism can't be underestimated. I was reading a book a, a little while ago called Machete Season, which brought something vividly to mind, even though it's an extreme case. Machete Season was written by a French journalist who went to Rwanda and interviewed uh, the people who committed the Rwandan genocide. And one of the guys she interviewed had decap decapitated his neighbor of 25 years with a machete. And she asked him, what were you thinking that moment when you chopped off the head of the guy you'd been living next to for 25 years? And the murderer was very articulate. He said, at that moment, the features that I had known for all those years sort of faded away. He lacked the normal human features. And he became sort of abstract and odd looking, like not a human being. And at that moment, I really didn't see him as the person I had known. And that's obviously an extreme case. But that lack of feature, that dehumanization, rung home with me because when I hear Democrats talk about Republicans in the House or vice versa, they talk about each other as if they, the other side lacks features. And that's in part because they don't know each other. Senator Evan Bayh from Indiana uh, told me that he served in the Senate for 12 years and the number of times the Senate got together as a body and actually talked about something, that happened twice in his 12 years. It happened at Clinton impeachment and after 9-11. And so there's just a tremendous sense of of, of tribalism and team spirit. And sort of what's happened, I think, is that for a lot of people, they're looking for social ties and social groupings. And the social groupings, the, the whole that used to be filled by ethnicity, by religion, by club, by geography, that spiritual whole is filled now with partisanship and party affiliation. And once you come to base your identity on party affiliation, then compromise, which seems normal, for most people, becomes a matter of dishonor because you're threatening your identity. And that's the system they're trapped in. And so one of the questions is, how deep is that? Is it something in the country or is it something in Washington? And my basic answer, it's 80% in Washington. Now it is true in the country, the electorate has gotten more polarized. It is true that as people move around the country, the, the, the geography has gotten more polarized. So the number of counties in this country where one party or another has a landslide majority, has doubled in a generation. So Republicans move into Republican areas, Democrats move into Democratic areas, and geographically there is some segmentation. But the trends out in the country do not explain what's happening in our political leadership. And so to me it's mostly a, these patterns of interaction that people are caught in within Washington itself. Now what's the root of this polarization, these patterns of social interaction. Well, there is no one route. I can list off dozens of, of factors that have contributed. Some of them are airplanes. It used to be when you came to Congress in the 1940s and 50s, you brought your family and you lived there and you got to know people. But now because of airplanes, everyone leaves on Thursdays. So they don't spend the weekends there, they don't bring their families there, there's no social interaction. Second, bourbon. They used to drink together. Now they, the only place there's bipartisan interaction is at the gym, and that only happens among the fit ones, which, <laughs> of which there are a few. Um, then there's a lack of, then there's the media, which segments people. Then there's fundraising. If you want to rise in your party leadership, the way you do it is by raising a lot of money. The people who are really good fundraisers tend to be quite partisan. And so that's another thing that contributes. Then frankly, there's the decline of the Protestant establishment. Back in the old days, maybe you had Republicans and Democrats, but maybe they, half of them went to Choate and Andover and Exeter and their families came over in the Mayflower. Now they've made it more diverse, but there isn't that social cohesion the Protestant establishment used to have back in the 1950s. So I could point to those and a million other factors that contribute to the polarization. But, it, but, but all these are part of it, but none of them explains it entirely. The polarization is what they call an emergent system a series of independent causes fusing to create one culture. And then once that culture is in place, it determines how people act. And it's very hard to get out of. And I see it shaping people in Congress, and tragically and interestingly, I've seen it shape President Obama. 
Now, I follow, President Obama is seven days older than me. I served as a reporter in Hyde Park in Chicago at the same time he was a community organizer there. And I've gotten to know him. I've seen him periodically since. I've seen him at the high moments. I, I had dinner with him two days before um, of the inauguration when he was the Messiah. There was a, a dinner at George Will's, Wolf, uh, George Will's house uh, for columnists. And uh, I remember Obama was actually carried into that dinner by cherubs, <laughs> sort of floated down there. I think uh, Rosie O'Donnell and Oprah Winfrey were there throwing rose petals at his feet to make sure he wouldn't touch mere earth. Uh, he said, David, what sort of wine would you like me to turn your water into? I was very appreciative. And then I saw him about 10 days ago. That's sort of the nadir so far of his presidency. And I will say a couple things about him. One, you, if you just judge by the conversation, you wouldn't know when he's up or down. He's, a, as I'll talk about in a minute, an incredibly calm guy. Well, I'll tell, I'll tell one story about his calmness. Uh, this is a story told me by Bob Schieffer. Schieffer moderated one of the debates, and uh, it was with John McCain. And when McCain came to his podium, McCain wrote on the legal pad his talking points. Uh, Obama came to his podium, didn't write anything on his legal pad, but every time Schieffer would ask him a question, he'd pick up a pen and write something. And so after the debate, one of Schieffer's assistants came up, went to Obama's podium, grabbed the legal pad as a souvenir, and it was a plain white piece of paper with a series of straight lines. So every time Schieffer had asked a question, he just picked it up, his pen, and drew on a straight line. And if you can do that, you are a calm guy. <laughs> And he is remarkably calm, and, and that's one thing, that he doesn't go up and down. The second thing is, and I'm like six notches to his right, I talk to him a fair bit. I talk to somebody around him almost every single day. And I would say, whether you agree with him or not, my belief is he is conducting himself in the presidency the way one would want a president to conduct himself, with integrity, with openness, with the general interest of the country at heart. And so I have followed him and I personally admire him a great deal. And really nothing or very little I've heard about in the past two years has really caused me to diminish uh, that personal admiration for the guy. Uh, he is personally a nice person uh, and there's some code of niceness around him. Usually when you attack a, or criticize a candidate or a president or a politician, their aides call you the next morning uh, and they scream at you and tell you you're a complete and total idiot. Uh, with the Obama people, they call you the next morning and they say, David, we uh, really like you, we respect your work. It's so sad, you're a complete and total idiot. Uh, but but that, that makes you feel better. Um, so you sort of respect the way he's organized things. Uh, he has a strong intellect, that's obvious, the story I tell about that, which was a, sort of a galvanizing moment for me. I was interviewing him one day in the, early in the campaign and I, I was, get, I was, we were talking about Lebanon and I was sort of done, uh, but I had some, he hadn't cut me off, so I kept asking questions. And out of the blue, I asked, um, have you ever read Reinhold Niebuhr, 1950s theologian? He said, yeah, I've read Niebuhr. And I said, well, what does Niebuhr mean to you? And he goes on for the next 20 minutes and describes a perfect summary of Reinhold Niebuhr's theology, which is a very complicated theology about using power while it corrupts you. And as Chris Matthews would say, that sent a tingle up my leg. Uh, it's impressive because it means he's not only reading for policy, he's reading for personal depth. And I think that that sometimes shows his ultimate trait, frankly, is self-confidence. Uh, I'm convinced in 80 years the word Obama will be the unit of measure for self-confidence. So we'll say, oh, he has 180 Obamas, he has 200 Obamas. Um, people who become president tend to be self-confident, but he is off the charts. And the things he says in private sort of are eye-popping. Some of them get out in public. One of them was reported in The New Yorker, and it was Obama talking to an aide, his political advisor, and he said to the guy, you know, I'm a better speechwriter than any of my speechwriters. I know more about policy in any particular policy area than any of my policy analysts, and I'm a better political analyst than any of you political analysts. And if you can talk that way, I'd say you have a high degree of self-confidence. <laughs> um, and so he has that. And this self-confidence, I think, in the course of this White House has had good sides and bad sides. The good side is a genuine culture of debate. And I think he really came in, as President Bush came in, really as Bush, in Bush's phrase, wanting to change the tone. I think Obama's perfect Washington. He's liberal, he knows that. He's sitting around with conservatives. They're looking over the data. They're choosing good policies and bad policies. 
and they have a seminar. Obama loves the seminar. He's hired very smart people thinking he could have an administration by discipline seminar, not like Clinton sprawling seminar, but Obama's a disciplined, organized seminar. And so half the people he hired come from Yale, half come from Harvard. Uh, if we're attacked by terrorists during the Harvard-Yale game, we're screwed, because they'll all be up there. Um, and he has people who are phenomenally good arguers. He had, in, you know, in one of the people who's leaving now is Larry Summers, a very intellectually imposing person. Another person, his chief of staff, was intellectually imposing, Rahm Emanuel, if somewhat uh, profane sometimes. Obama tells a good joke about Rahm, which was that Rahm lost his middle finger in a deli accident when he was slicing meat as a young man. And Obama jokes that when Rahm lost his middle finger, he was rendered mute, uh, which is... But, you know, the, the good side to that was they, they really have arguments that are intended to go beyond ideological thinking and actually dwell down on the evidence. And when you present him with a counter argument, uh, when you're interviewing him, he's perfectly aware of your argument, he's aware of the evidence, and it's impressive. Uh, I remember there was a debate over uh, whether to release torture memos, and they literally sat in Rahm's office, and the people on one side had, had a few minutes to present their case, the people on the other side had a few minutes. They, they debated for an hour or so, and then Obama rendered a judgment. And I think ideally that's the way he'd like government to be. Uh, and so that, that, if you could have a government like that, I really think you would uh, change some of the tone, diffuse some of the ideological rancor which poisons the politics. The problem, of course, is politics isn't like that. Uh, government isn't often like that. And much of the blame goes to the interest groups. Much of it goes to Republicans. But some of it goes to Obama. And why Obama is a tragic case is because I think he helped create a uh, situation which exacerbated partisanship. And I think the, the things that caused him to do that grow out of the good sides, in particular the self-confidence. He came in and, thought, and tried to do too much all at once, and I think set a lot of people back. So in the first six months of the administration, there were 131 major initiatives. This was at a time when the administration was barely staffed, woefully understaffed. They had a great deal of trouble filling top position jobs because it turns out nobody in America actually pays taxes. Uh, and so they would offer people jobs and they'd say, I'd love to do that job, but you should be aware I have a little problem. I didn't pay my taxes for a couple decades, but it's really not an issue. And then they'd offer it to somebody else and they'd say, oh, I'd love to do that, but I have a little tax issue you should be aware of. And so they had a great deal of trouble. I remember I went to interview Secretary Geithner in the first days when he's, he's organizing the uh, TARP and the stress tests and all that. And usually when you interview the Treasury Secretary, you give your ID to the guard in the Treasury building, and a sort of a team of factotums take you back to the Secretary's office. This time there was no factotums because they hadn't been hired yet. The guard tells me to go back to room 232. I knock on the door. Geithner's in there making coffee, sweeping the floor, trying to <laughs> reorganize the economy. And that hyperactivity grew out of self-confidence, the belief that we could do everything all at once. Then the decision to spend too much grew out of a sense that we got to do a lot all at once. They inherited a terrible fiscal situation, but they added $9.8 trillion in new debt over the next nine years. Uh, by 2019, the interest payments on the debt alone will pass $800 billion a year. And that's simply unaffordable. And then finally, there was the, I think they, they, they had a, a false belief about what government was gonna be like right now. When they came to office, they had a sense they were leading a new historical epic. And they cost themselves, and especially the president, and people around him, in these incredibly heroic roles. They read on average about seven New Deal books per capita, and they thought they were gonna do that again. And that was heroic and sort of admirable, but badly misread the country. This was a country extremely anxious because of the crisis, anxious about change. They exacerbated that anxiety by trying to change a lot all at once. This was a country with a sense of shame over indebtedness. They exacerbated that shame when they increased public debt to go along with a high private debt. This was a country with no faith in authority. The most important polling statistic in our lifetime is the one that's been asked decade after decade, do you trust government to do the right thing most of the time? In the 30s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, 80% of Americans trusted government to do the right thing most of the time. 
now it's 19%. So if you're in a country very suspicious of Washington and government, you better understand if you're going to concentrate authority in Washington, there's going to be a backlash. This was a country worried about jobs. They spent a lot of time on health care. So I think in their overconfidence, they misread the country, and they, they prompted this backlash. And this backlash took, in some sense, an ideological form. What happened in, in the crucial moments were first in between June and August of 2009, that health care summer, the independents all shifted. So the number of independents who thought Obama was too liberal rose by 22 percentage points, and the number of independents who supported the Republicans over the Democrats also rose by 20 percentage points. And the swing of those independents really shifted uh, the Midwest in this last election. If you look at where Republicans picked up gains, it's oh, Indiana, Ohio, over into Pennsylvania, Michigan, Iowa. The entire, basically, the, the independent Midwest shifted away from the president. The second thing they did by misreading the country is stoke up this Tea Party. Now, my one sentence explanation of the Tea Party is that they use Abby Hoffman means to achieve Norman Rockwell ends. Uh, and what I mean by that is, when you look at the America they envision, it's sort of a, a typical, traditional America. And if you had to take a biography of a uh, typical Tea Party member, he would be the guy who went to high school, studied hard when other people were not, got into college. Maybe in college he wanted to major in history, uh, but he had to make a living, so he majored in accounting. He took a job, maybe doesn't love his job, but he's supporting his family. He bought a house. He didn't buy a house he couldn't afford with some super duper mortgage. He bought a responsible house he could afford. In other words, all through his life, he played by the rules, and he expects people who play by the rules to be rewarded. But when he looks around what's happened over the last two years, he, see pe he sees people who didn't play by the rules, whether on Wall Street or down the block, being rewarded while he's getting the bill. And this makes him angry. And the number of Tea Party people who have told me this story, I bought a house, the mortgage is a pain, but I'm paying it. Somebody else in my neighborhood bought a house, the, more, the value of the house went underwater, and they left. And that, there's a sense that the economic values of this country are being undermined. And that sort of riffles through the movement. And I have some sympathy with that. What I have less sympathy for is the means they used to go about it, which is, in, off, in many cases, the narcissism of partisanship. The belief that you get to choose the facts that support your point of view, or choose the fictions that support your point of view. You get to imagine that your opponents are uniquely evil. You get to imagine that America was this libertarian wonderland until this foreigner, Barack Obama, came along and turned us into France. It's a twisting of, of fact to support the narcissism of your own point of view. And so some of the procedures and means that are used, I can have less sympathy for. But the upshot is, that we have after Obama, who promised and wanted to be this transcendent postpartisan figure, we now are in a world with hyperpartisanship worse than ever before. We've had two, I guess maybe three presidents in a row who've set out intentionally to change the tone in Washington, and we've had three presidents in a row who failed at it, and it's become worse. Uh, and so now we enter a new era with the post election. Uh, and so we're and this era is in one sense very dark and in one sense very light. I'll start with the, the, the dark parts. What we're going to see over the next two years, most people seem to think, is, is stagnation. I think we'll see some compromise on some little things, taxes, maybe some education bills, uh, infrastructure. There'll be some compromises because everyone has an incentive. But on the fundamental things, there's going to be very little change. If you look at President Obama and ask him, uh, what does this election tell you? Should you change? Do you need to change your administration? The basic answer is, well, the economy was bad and we had a bad messaging problem. I didn't pay enough attention to politics. Uh, you know, I spent a lot of time around this White House. The idea that they didn't pay attention to politics is ludicrous. They think about politics. Everyone thinks about politics. And I think they are badly misreading the country. I, I've spoken in the last few weeks to people in the Clinton administration who described the serious thinking they did after 1994. And they did some serious thinking. And as someone who's sympathetic to this president and has a lot of friends in the administration, I can tell you they're not doing that. 
They're just waiting for the economy to recover, and I think that's a mistake. In Congress, there's going to be not a lot of change either. Nancy Pelosi and Harry Reid will still be there on the Democratic side. On the Republican side, you have a party that has basically learned the lesson of 2008. And the lesson of 2008, they think, was we lost the country because we wasn't, weren't conservative enough. And the further we go to the right, the better we'll be. And I think that's also a bogus lesson to be drawn, but that is the lesson that has been drawn. There is some humility on the Republican side, to be fair. They know they're unpopular. They know they can't re repeat the mistakes of 1994. But nonetheless, there is a belief that success comes from holding the line and not compromising. And the people who do compromise, like Robert Bennett of Utah, are no longer going to be in the Senate. So that's the dark side. The dark side is a, a Congress after this election, a country that desperately wants change, but which has unintentionally, I think, locked in the status quo. And so what we're going to have over the next uh, few years, we'll have two years of stagnation, and then we'll, that will be followed by the breather, which will be national bankruptcy. Uh, I'm convinced in 10 years uh, we'll go through a gigantic fiscal crisis. If you look at where the numbers are and the spending and the debt, it becomes unsustainable at some point. No one knows when that point will be because the bond market is, is with you until the second they're against you. And they will flip psychologically at some point. And I often ask economists in the White House and in Congress and elsewhere, you know, when are we going to get serious and solve this problem? And the general answer I get, I got from somebody in the White House recently, well, we'll have a big financial crisis and then we'll get serious and solve the problem. Uh, maybe we could solve the problem before the financial crisis? Nah, I don't really see that. Uh, well, what sort of financial crisis will we have? Will it be like a Greek-style financial crisis? Nah, a little worse than that. Decline and fall of the Roman Empire? Maybe not so bad, somewhere in the middle there. Uh, and so I'm, I'm firmly convinced that that's gonna happen. Uh, I have a friend who's, who worked until today in New York City school system and used to work in the Clinton administration. He sent me an email uh, not long ago saying, I've never been so optimistic about education reform than I am right now. I've never been so pessimistic about government than I am right now. And that's about exactly where I am. And so we're going to have a period heading toward national bankruptcy when the fundamental things will not be solved. The economy may recover from the recession, but the structural problems, the inequality, the wage stagnation, the environmental problems, the health care cost problems, all these will be unaddressed for 10 years. And so this is sort of a dark picture. Uh, and Washington will be even uglier. And yet I've decided as, as characteristically uh, to wax um, Leninist uh, that the worse the better. Because if we're going to have something to break us out of this solution or break us out of this situation, it's not going to come from Washington. It's going to have to come from a mobilization outside of Washington. And the worse things are in Washington over the next 13 months until the Iowa caucuses begin, the more likely it is that we will see a mobilization outside of Washington. If the Obama people can rally in 2008 and have a big mass movement come out of nowhere, if the Tea Party people can rally in 2010, have a big mass movement come out of nowhere, then other people who are sick of the way government is, work, is not working can rally in 2012 and something new can change. And so I've decided to take an attitude that things are about to get an awful lot better, that we're in a pre-revolutionary situation where big changes could happen. Because a sane, serious country like the United States doesn't usually walk into national bankruptcy without some serious attempt to avert it. And these changes have to happen on a couple levels. There has to be a change in the intellectual landscape, there has to be a change in the institutional landscape, and there has to be a change in the political landscape. Now institutionally, uh, first let's start uh, with mentally. There have to be new norms. You know, I was telling, I think, Bruce earlier today, or I told some students earlier today, I was reading Churchill's memoirs. And he has a great memoir of his early childhood. And one of the episodes he describes in this memoir is of a, uh, of a, a dinner party he went to where he met an ambassador who'd been in London from a foreign country for 25 years. And this dinner party took place in 1895. And Churchill said, you've been here 25 years. What have you learned over that period? And the ambassador said, in the time I've been here, absolutely everything has changed. When I got here, the same 400 aristocratic families owned the property and they controlled the political system. 
Now, 25 years later, they don't. You have a much more democratic country and a much more industrial and affluent country. You've essentially had the French Revolution spread over 25 years without spilling a drop of blood. And that's the sort of political change I think we should find tremendously attractive. It's a gradual, step-by-step -step process, deep within the society, where both parties contribute. And they contribute through a process of competition, but constructive competition. There was, party in the, there was partisanship in the Victorian era, but it wasn't the partisanship of either or. It was, it was taking terms and where both parties are bringing their gifts to the table. And we don't have that sort of constructive competition. We have a more poisonous competition. Then there has to be structural changes in Washington. We need to change the schedules so that they don't only vote Monday through Thursday, they stick around for the weekend and actually socialize and get to know each other. There have to be uh, mental changes. There has to be ridicule for people who live in the cocoons, liberals who live in the MSNBC cocoon, conservatives who live in the Fox cocoon. There has to be uh, institutional changes through the society. If you're a president, one of the things you learn, and this is something President Obama has learned, something President Bush learned, you come into office thinking you can do change. You get into office and realize uh, how little change you can actually do. I asked President Bush at the end of his term, what's the one, th one of the things you've learned? And he said, there's a lot of passive aggressive behavior in government. You give an order, nobody follows it. And that's something President Obama has learned. And if you're gonna have change, you have to have big institutions in society helping you. And one of the things President Obama has complained about is if I do the straight liberal thing, there are huge organizations, the unions, the public sector unions, the liberal interest groups, the donors, they'll be with me at my back. If I try to break out of the partisan orthodoxy and do something in the middle, there's nobody. There are no institutions there to help me. And so there have to be institutions there built up to support non-orthodox points of view. And then finally, there have to be mental changes, and this is the most important. Why are centrists so underrepresented in American politics when they are not un underrepresented in the country. Well, part of it has to do with redistricting and all that, but the main thing is intellectual. Moderates lose because they have no belief system. If you go to a liberal dinner, there's academics and think tankers to give you policy ideas. You go to a conservative dinner, there are academics and think tankers to give you policy ideas. If you go to a centrist dinner, it's just a bunch of lobbyists. There are no ideas in the center of American life. And to me, that's a tragedy because I think there's a tradition there waiting to be reborn to give intellectual coherence to people who are not orthodox liberals or conservatives. To put it very simply, and I hesitate to do that in this building, but there are two parties in this country, but there are really three political traditions. There's a liberal tradition that believes in using government to enhance equality. There's a conservative tradition that believes in limited government to enhance freedom. And there is a another tradition which believes in limited but energetic government to enhance social mobility. And this tradition starts with Alexander Hamilton. I saw a picture of where's Hamilton on the bulletin board over there. Well, Hamilton, as some of you may know, I'm gonna get the dates wrong, but you'll get the idea. When he was, his father ran away when he was very young. When he was 12, his mother died in the bed next to him. He was adopted by an uncle who committed suicide within a year. He was adopted by his grandparents who both died within the following year. So between age 12 and 14, he'd lost everything he ever loved and known. So at 14, he's bereft. By 25, he'd been George Washington's chief of staff, a revolutionary war hero. By 30, he'd written the Federalist Papers, become a successful lawyer. By 40, he'd retired as the most successful treasury secretary in American history. And so what he did when he was treasury secretary is to create a political economic system to make it possible for poor boys like him to succeed. He used the debt to create capital markets, to create social dynamism. He used industrial policy. He used research policy. He used arts funding policy. He used government not to create a big welfare state, but to enhance social mobility. And that tradition was followed on by the Whig Party. It was followed on by Lincoln and the early Republican Party, who did the Land Grant College Act, the Homestead legislation, the railroad legislation. It was followed on by Teddy Roosevelt and that Republican Party. It lasted up until, the, say, the 1950s, where in California you had a succession of governors like Earl Warren and Pat Brown, who used government to build the finest school system in the world, 
do the big infrastructure projects, uh, create the highways, the water projects. And this was using government not to create a big welfare state, but to create social mobility, use government to enhance social mobility. That third tradition more or less died starting around the Barry Goldwater campaign because the debate became between big government and little government and this third tradition was caught crosswise in that debate. To me, reviving that tradition, that Hamiltonian tradition, is the essence of what a th another tradition in American life should do, and it would have a depolarizing effect. It would be a tradition which is much more believing in government to addressing the core problems of inequality and wage stagnation than the Republican Party, but much more hostile to the idea of spending so much money on the public sector employee unions and some of the encrustations that have built up around the welfare state that Democrats, for political reasons, pr protect. And so filling out that third tradition, giving some weight and intellectual substance that will take us outside the boxes of the two parties seems to me one of the fundamental tasks ahead. So I've decided to believe, maybe against all reason, that there is a great opportunity over the next 13 months, an opportunity to build new social norms, to build new institutions, and to build an intellectual base. And I maintain my optimism against all sanity because though the government right now is fundamentally screwed up, the country is fundamentally healthy. You spend a day like today, I did it with the Duke students, uh, and you come away as you do in all st student bodies, just tremendously impressed. And that impression is not only fortified by meeting people, it's fortified by data. And I know in academia one likes data. Uh, but if you look at the social indicators that went south in the 1960s and 70s, they're all heading in the right direction right now. And it's because of this generation of people under 30. Teenage pregnancy is down by a third, abortion rates are down by a third, domestic violence is down by 50%, violent crime is down by 70%. This is the most wholesome and responsible generation in US history. They're all gonna have the biggest midlife crisis in human history in about 10 years. <laughs> but until that moment, it's really a fortifying generation. And then finally, you just look at the, uh, the eternal dynamism of American life. People, Europeans came to these shores 400 years ago and they saw a forest that stretched on for thousands of miles. They saw flocks of geese so big that it took them 45 minutes to take off and they had two thoughts. The thought was that first, God's plan for humanity would be completed on this continent and second, that they could get phenomenally rich in the process. Uh, and this moral materialism has infused American culture and continues to. And one sees it around every day. You see it in Ben and Jerry's ice cream, the ice cream company with its own foreign policy. I <laughs> joke in one of my books that Ben and Jerry should make a pacifist toothpaste, doesn't kill germs, just ask them to leave. Uh, it'd be a big seller. You see it in the uh, high-minded grocery stores that you have around here, um, Trader Joe's, Whole Foods, these progressive grocery stores where all the cashiers look like they're on loan from Amnesty International. Um, my favorite section in the Whole Foods is the snack food section, uh, which uh, they couldn't sell pretzels and potato chips, that would be vulgar. Uh, so they sell these seaweed-based snacks. Uh, in my house, we buy something called veggie booty with kale, which is for kids who come home and say, Mom, Mom, I want a snack that will help prevent colon rectal cancer. Uh, that's a big, big seller. Uh, and then you see it, you know, I always say if you really want to get the optimistic soul of America, you go to a Home Depot and watch an American man buy a barbecue grill, because that's when he's most emotionally exposed. Uh, and he's going to buy the big 942-inch grill in case he gets the urge to roast a bison. And he wheels it out to his Yukon XL, and he's out there in one of the big box malls. There's sort of a pet smart way over here and a pet co over there, gigantic parking lot, and just over the curvature of the earth, you can see an old navy, sort of big enough to qualify for the United Nations. Uh, you see all the luxury cars lined up, the Saabs and Audis and Volvos, because in these neighborhoods, it's socially acceptable to have a luxury car so long as it comes from a country hostile to US foreign policy. Uh, and then sort of along the highway, there are all the suburban theme restaurants, which if they merged, would be called Chili's Olive Garden Hard Rock Outback Cantina uh, there. And then you've got your Walmart over here, and then my favorite store, which is the Costco over here, which is like Walmart on acid. Uh, it's here you can get your bags of 60 pounds of tater tots, 
uh, 120 pound boxes of detergent, uh, 6,000 Q-tips in a container, which is 12,000 swabs because there's one at either end. I always go to these stores and say, you know, who comes here shopping for condoms? Because the <laughs> quantities are so gigantic. Um, that's a sign of America's eternal optimism. Uh, and the other thing about these places, is that everyone's having the same conversation about how much money they're saving by buying in bulk. So you'll hear somebody say, you know, we should get 10,000 popsicles because we were thinking of having kids anyway. And, the same way. Uh, and so the core message is that our politics really are fundamentally screwed up and we're stuck in a situation that's going to require radical change. But the country is basically healthy and we'll be fine in the long run. So thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Uh, thanks for your comments, Mr. Brooks. Uh, I just wanted to start my question, uh, and it, it covers your last point where you said that um, the country's generally in a good, good condition. Uh, Spock, who you know from Star Trek, uh, said of the planet Ardana, uh, in which rulers lived in the clouds in luxury, above miners who toiled below in I misery. I remember that episode, yes. He said, this troubled planet is a place of the most violent contrast. Those that receive the rewards are totally separate from those who shoulder the burdens. It is not a wise leadership. So my question is, why is income inequality the worst in the United States now than it was uh, last time before the Great Depression uh, and has particularly been bad since 1980? Um, uh, since when the richest 1% of Americans uh, account for 25% of uh, the income growth since 1980? And uh, what can Republicans in Congress now do to address that situation? And my second question is just a brief comment. Um, Iraq was listed as the most dangerous place for journalists in the world. Um, it seems like the United States should be at least in the top five, given how Octavia Nasser, Helen Thomas, Ray Sanchez, Juan Williams, and Keith Olbermann have all been reprimanded for things that they've done as journalists. Um, what is your opinion on the influence of corporate America on the independence, credibility, and sustainability of the mainstream media? That's Thanks. three 45 minute questions right there. Um, first on the journalists, um, I'm willing to tolerate offensive speech by the people I don't agree with. I'm willing to give them all a pass, basically. Uh, I, I think we've gotten into the, into the tendency, for some reason it's become fine management for people in journalistic business to uh, fire people, the idea is you gotta act quickly. Somehow the message became you gotta get out in front of the story. And we now have a hair trigger firing technique. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of people say stupid things. A lot of people who fill microphones up for hours a day say stupid things. I'm for maximum feasible tolerance of anything. Uh, just on that, that was the easiest of your questions. The next one, and maybe the last one I'll talk about is inequality. It is without question, uh, inequality has magnified around the world. Why has it happened? It's, and it's happened worse here than everywhere else just about, well, of, of comparable nations. Why has it happened? Well, some of them are obvious. The, uh, uh, the increasing work, the increasing education premium. And to me, what's troubling is not only here income inequality, but social inequality. We've always had some inequality in the country but if you grew up in a family in 1964 without a high school degree, uh, I mean without a college degree and with a college degree, basically your families were similar. The divorce rates were similar, the voting rates were similar, your uh, engagement in your community was similar. That's no longer true. So people with college degrees have half the divorce rates as people with high school degrees. People with college degrees have much, much, much lower children out of wedlock rates. People with college degrees have much higher voting rates. 
Interestingly, Robert Putnam is, at Harvard has done studies, much, much higher levels of social distrust among people with high school degrees than college degrees. So we're not, we're talking about income inequality and that's part of it, but we're also talking about pervasive social and mental inequality. And one of the reasons the Tea Party phenomenon is so uh, strong, I think, is, and why Sarah Palin has some appeal, is that a lot of people take a look at basically college grads, Republican or Democrat, and say those people know nothing about the way I live. They just don't look like me, they don't talk like me, they don't know anything about my life. And one of the things we tend to underestimate, those of us who live in neighborhoods with high college degreed uh, people, is the, the increase in social disorganization. The increase in divorce at those levels, drug and alcohol addiction problems, and children out of wedlock. And one of the things that has frankly strengthened the Republican Party, and the Republican Party has done better among the white working class than uh, than any other, uh, at any other time, because they represent that level of social conservatism that a lot of people think will restore a level of so basic social order. My basic rule of politics is that the, the country generally votes for the candidate they think will be the most orderly. So after 9-11, Bush seemed orderly compared to Kerry. After Katrina, Iraq, and the fiscal crisis, the calm Obama seemed more orderly than Bush or than McCain, who was more hyperactive. There is a great hunger for social order, which people think will be a foundation for a more uh, mobile life. And the final thing I'll say about inequality, and this is a vast debate, but one thing that matters a lot to me, is we do a phenomenal job of getting people into high school and getting people into college. We do an extremely mediocre job of getting them through high school and through college. Our college completion rates have essentially been flat over 30 or 40 years. And if you drop out of high school, you drop out of college, you're, you know, you've got troubles for the rest of your life. And one of the things I think is being appreciated now, but has been unappreciated for a long time, is the importance of emotional relationships in getting through these procedures. Now I'm a middle-aged man, I'm needless to say uncomfortable talking about love and emotion one of my favorite apocryphal brain scan stories is they put, took a bunch of middle-aged guys, uh, they put them in a brain scan machine, fMRI machine, they had them watch a horror movie, and then they had them describe their feelings toward their wives, and the brains were identical. It was just sheer terror in both cases. So I'm like, not comfortable talking about this. But one of the things we've shortchanged in education reform is the fact that people learn from people they love. And if there's not a loving relationship between teacher and a parent, that child will not do well. If there's not loving relationships between college students and each other, they're much more likely to drop out. If their child does not grow up in a home with a secure attachment to mom, that child is much more likely to drop out. There was a study done at University of Minnesota where they took, looked at how children attach to their moms at age 18 months, and they could predict with 77% accuracy who would graduate from high school at 18 months. Because if you know how to use adults as a tool for learning, then you will be able to do fine in high school. If you don't know how to use adults, relate logically to them, you'll be frustrated. The other famous thing, and finally, and I'll mention this very quickly, is I'm sure a lot of you know the Walter Michelle marshmallow studies. The marsh Michelle took a four-year-old, put them in a room, put a marshmallow in front of them, said to them, you can eat the marshmallow now. I'm going to come back in 10 minutes. If you haven't eaten the marshmallow, I'll give you two marshmallows. There's very famous studies. Uh, Michelle shows me videos of uh, those little girls trying not to eat the marshmallow. One little girl is banging her head on the table. Um, one little guy, Michelle, was using an Oreo cookie. The little guy picks up the Oreo, eats out the middle, and carefully puts it back on the table. And that kid is now a US senator. But uh, uh, the, the kids who could wait seven or eight minutes uh, 20 years later, much higher college completion rates. 30 years later, much higher incomes. The kids who could wait one minute, much higher incarceration rates, much higher drug and alcohol addiction problems. Because at that early age, you either learn to control your impulses or you don't. And if you can control your impulses, school will be doable. If you can't, it'll be frustrating. And so it took us a long time to understand that income equality, part of it is caused by technological change, part of it is caused by globalization, but a lot of it is caused by the deepest wellsprings of human capital, the emotional makeup of people. 
And if, unless we solve that part, the other part's less, uh, less effective. Just one. Thanks a lot. Uh, thank you very much for your talk tonight, uh, Mr. Brooks. Um, the, the scenario you're describing where it's, it's likely for the next 13 months we have gridlock and, uh, you know, hopefully by 2012 the public will be ready for perhaps a more moderate candidate. Brings to mind maybe somebody like uh, Mayor Bloomberg in New York. Um, I was wondering, like, how optimistic slash pessimistic are you that someone like him or, or he running for president could coalesce those uh, desires for people to move to the center to not only get himself elected, perhaps, but also uh, representatives that were more towards the center to get elected and to work with him rather than, say, he gets elected president and then he's still, you know, dealing with this rabble of partisan people in Congress. Yeah, well, you know, Bloomberg came reasonably close to running, as I understand it. If it had been Hillary Clinton against, say, Mitt Romney, I think he probably would have run. But when it became McCain against Obama in the last race, the center was sort of filled up. Now, the question is, would there be room? And he's obviously thinking about it. He's exploring it. Uh, and he has a lot of money. He has the reputation for competence and effectiveness that I think what you need, I think what the country wants is a boring, competent, prime, hopefully short leader. Uh, and so I, I, I say I want, if the Republicans, I'm hoping Mitch Daniels got the nomination. He's 5'7", close to the ground. Uh, and and uh, Mayor Bloomberg's about the same height. I think the country's ready for a short guy to be president. Uh, I don't know why I'm obsessed with this. Uh, <laughs> by the way, on this, and I love the social science statistics, and this is a, a, a detour, but uh, we know from online dating studies that a guy who's five foot six can get as many date offers from women as a guy who's six foot, so long as he makes $172,000 a year more. <laughs> so that's... That's extraneous, but important to me. No, I'm, I'm happily married. Uh, but, but I do think, I, I have never thought there's a window open for a third party until this year. Uh, and I say that because if you look at, say in 1994, there was a big turnover, but both parties had reasonably high approval ratings in the, in the mid to upper 50s. Now there's another turnover, but both parties have very low approval ratings. There genuinely has been an increase in the number of people who call themselves independents. They're looking for a home. And now I don't know if Bloomberg's the guy, but for the first time, I think there's a role, there's a possibility. Uh, and there's a possibility because as the Tea Party showed, you do not have to be a majority to have a gigantic effect on American politics. You just have to be a mobilized minority. And so I think there's a, a possibility there. Uh, I wouldn't bet on it. I would think that Obama will be smart enough to try to move back to the center and recapture some of that ground. But right now, if you look at how Obama's doing in Ohio, say, if you ran Obama against uh, Bush, Obama right now in Ohio would lose by about 15 percentage points. Obama against Palin, Obama against everybody loses in Ohio. It's hard to win the presidency without winning Ohio. And so that suggests there's some ground there. Obama has a lot of work to do to make up the center. If he doesn't make it up, there's a chance for a third party. Hi, I'm um, a student in the Divinity School, and we talk a lot about Abe Lincoln saying that um, to have charity to all and malice towards none. And I feel like every time you speak on NPR or today or meet the press, you always have that sort of communication, and I really appreciate it. Um, in a former life, I was a political consultant for four years in D.C., and I was a part of the uh, defacing, if you will. Um, I was involved, I feel like, in a lot of that. How can we get people to talk, communicate more with each other the way that you communicate to a greater audience? And, I mean, is there any way to do that? Well, it's a, it's a question of what's acceptable and what's not acceptable. If uh, people are applauded for, you know, say... Uh, I don't want to, I'm thinking of many examples, but if people are applauded for uh, imagining that Barack Obama is a socialist or the Tea Party people are a bunch of racists, then they'll be encouraged. I mean, it's like Pavlov. Uh, and so it's a question of changing social norms. And one of the things that's been frustrating is that the country is essentially in the middle, but we have a false view of the country because of the media and because of what's, what's rewarded in the media business. 
And people in the media business are rewarded for A, filling the screen, and B, catering to a relatively small audience. So I told some students earlier today, Fox News has a, huge ratings. But Morris Fiorina at Stanford points out that more Americans own, uh, own ferrets than watch Fox News. <laughs> and so there are, there are like three or four million ferret owners in the country, and maybe O'Reilly gets 1.5 million viewers a night. And so there's just huge amounts of people who are unrepresented by the media, but the, because of the way MSNBC and Fox are, they inculcate certain patterns of communication. And so it, it's mostly up to social norms. The second thing I do think we could do is, is increase social interchange. I'm for raft trips. Take Republicans and Democrats, take them on raft trips. Uh, because, you know, I, I, go for, I, I have a very dumb policy of interviewing one Democrat for one Republican. I just go from office to office. And I can tell you they tell the most ridiculous stories about each other. Uh, and they just don't know. And I, I sort of feel if they got to know each other, drinking or raft trip, whatever, some of the stupidity would fade away. But that's a tall order. Hi, thanks Mr. Brooks for coming. I've long grown up with you and Mark Shields on my Friday afternoons. Um, I had a question. You mentioned that instead of this poisonous partisanship, um, cultivating a uh, culture of uh, constructive competition between the parties. Um, so my question to you is, what are some concrete steps that we can create this culture and who should be the leader of it? Does it need to be President Obama? Does it need to come from Congress? How do we create that? Well, I mean, a, lot, a couple things I talked about, uh, mentioned changing the voting patterns so they, people actually get together, changing the redistricting uh, would help. So there's one of the things one finds is that each party has, each district has members who are more polarized than the actual district. Uh, and I do think, I, as I say, there's not a legislative fix. Gerrymandering won't do it. I don't think campaign finance reform will do it. People are caught in, in these social tribal cycles. Uh, and it will take leadership. Uh, it takes someone saying, uh, I'll take a hit from my party. Uh, to do something that crosses uh, to the other party. And that's actually very hard to do. Politics is a team sport. And one of the hardest things to do is to say and do things that member of, members of your team think are cowardice. I remember I went in to see Chuck Hagel, was senator from Nebraska. And I remember I went in to interview him one day when he had come out more or less against the war in Iraq. It was about 2005, 2006. And the Democrats had taken out front full page ads in the New York Times with Chuck Hagel's face with his words criticizing Bush's handling of the war. And so the Democrats were using this Republican senator as a tool to win their election struggle in 2006. Well, it's very hard to be Chuck Hagel that day. And it requires a, a tradition of people willing to do that. Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, you know, worked for President Johnson and then worked for President Nixon and took a lot of crap from people at Harvard. Uh, and yet he was willing to do it. This, the other thing that comes to mind with Moynihan, again, I, it's not legislative, it's mental and attitudinal. Moynihan had a great phrase, which I quote all the time, which is the central conservative truth is that culture matters most. The central liberal truth is that government can change culture. When you have an attitude like that, you have an attitude that each side brings something to the table. The Republicans bring an admiration for the free society and dynamism. The liberals bring an admiration for, for equality. Uh, and these, both these things are sort of parts of the truth. And that basic attitude is something I would say is largely missing in the more totalistic attitudes that one finds on Capitol Hill. So again, uh, it's not like a pieces of legislation we can change. It takes changes in attitude, mentality, and social norms. Mr. Brooks, you mentioned the wave in 2008 for Obama, the wave in 2010 for the Tea Party, and the hope for a wave before a financial crisis so, of a third way. It's pretty clear that there were precipitating events to both the 2008 wave and the 2010 wave. What sort of precipitating event needs to occur before the, a, a financial crisis, like you're thinking, in order to encourage such a wave? 
Right, well, the precipitating events would be, well, A, a hiccup in the bond market. We're constantly selling bonds, and they, at, at the moment, there's people who want to buy them, but that doesn't actually, it doesn't actually mean that's going to happen. The second thing, I think, is there's a possibility, and nobody knows the answer to this, that we will have a much longer recession than we think, and that this, if you look at the aftermaths of financial crisis, you tend to get six, eight years, and if continually we see unemployment rates in the eights or nines, then what, what you see is this buildup of frustration. And that buildup cumulatively can turn very sour. The late 30s were not a great period for American culture, but it, can, it might be able to turn in a different way depending on leadership. So it may be a cumulative effect of seeing the fiscal crisis, anxiety about China and India, which is pervasive, and then a sense that the jobs aren't coming back. Uh, you know, the, there could be worse things, God knows, that could happen. Uh, but, but you don't need much because the, con the attitudes of the country are different than the attitudes before. I mentioned the level of cynicism in the country. That really is a change from an, a declining change for the past 20 years. Um, as, somebody, okay. uh, as somebody whose Facebook politics line says passionately moderate and moderately passionate, I'm very interested and intrigued by your optimism that centrists um, could play a larger role than they seem to be right now. And I think for people like me who are not um, identified with a party, part of what turns us off is the partisanship. And as you said, to, uh, to move high in the party, you have to be very good at fundraising. And what seems to make you good at fundraising is the games of partisanship and sending out fundraising letters that vilify the other side. If there were to be this sort of groundswell movement, um, like what happened with Obama in 08 and the Tea Party in 2010, that would be more centrist. One thing that seems to be different is that both of those had sympathetic media. So there were media who were sometimes notoriously sympathetic to Obama and also media that have been very supportive of the Tea Party. And I'm just wondering what sorts of, of media might um, also be conjoined with a more centrist view um, and how you would also sort of overcome these fundraising questions and, and things that have sort of pushed the power centers to the left and to the right. I'm imagining a rally of 200,000 NPR listeners and you know, uh, really fair-minded people. Uh, we could be wrong, but we think we're right. Uh, we're sort of ambivalent for this, but we're sort of... Um, I, I, we're gonna, Shields and I will do a, a segment one day and people will just come out of their living rooms. And, uh, no. it is a, it, I mean, it sort of is a problem. Uh, but, you know, there, I would say the good news is if you went to a think tank uh, in, uh, in Washington, and I don't care if it's a liberal think tank or a conservative think tank, and you said, what do we need to do to, can you hammer out a budget deal that both parties could agree on? I don't care what think tank you could walk into, they'd hammer it out in five minutes. People basically know what needs to be done. We need to raise taxes, we need to means test entitlements. Some people want a VAT tax, some people want some other a gas tax. Basically, the experts are, could hammer it out in five minutes. The substance is, in, it's like the Middle East peace process. Everyone basically knows where the end result is gonna be. The problem is no one knows the avenue to get there. And so, if someone came out and said, I am gonna have a, uh, a tax bill and we're gonna tax employee health care benefits, we're probably gonna have to put on a sales tax, we're probably gonna have to cut Medicare benefits for the affluent, we're probably gonna have to raise the retirement age, we're probably gonna have to cut the budget, uh, the defense budget a bit. If somebody came out and said that, you would have a thousand policy wonks marching down K Street in joyous rapture. <laughs> so that's not the problem, the media is there. The problem is would the American people be there? If you follow the Republican campaigns, uh, this year, it was we must cut spending and we must restore the $400 million Obama cut from the Medicare budget. You can't be for both those things. And they did that because they think that's where the American people are. Now the question is, are the American people really there? And I think that's a much more complicated issue than it used to be. 
If you look at what's happening in Britain, you have a conservative government doing essentially, I think, what needs to be done, raising taxes and cutting spending. And their approval ratings are actually doing fine. You go to New Jersey, you've got a guy, Chris Christie, doing some serious spending cuts. He was elected with 49% of the vote. His approval rating is now 57% of the vote. The people in New Jersey understand what needs to be done. Do the people around the country understand that? I'm not sure they're there yet. But every week, I think more people are. And as the crisis becomes more obvious, more people are willing to say, yes, I'll take my hit as long as everybody takes the hit. Now, the barrier that has to be faced after that is that you can trust your government to do this fairly. Because trust in government is so damn low, people think they're gonna lie to us, I'll end up taking the hit and nobody else will. And so you've gotta do all those things at once, but the fundamental change has to come from the country saying, we understand the problem, we're willing to take the hit, the greatest generation took the hit, we're gonna take the hit. Uh, and that's up to you, baby boomers, you spoiled narcissists. Um, so, thank you very much.